This is from a recorded talk. So we sit in meditation now in order to bring our minds to peace. And five days, these working days, we have our duties to do, have occupations that we need to get involved with. These five days have passed. And in those days, we needed to use a lot of energy, both in our bodies and in our hearts, in order to find wealth, to find money, to find the necessities of life, so that we can live our lives in a way that isn't difficult, that has ease. And now we've reached the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and so this is a time for us to develop our hearts, to build up merit, to raise skillfulness. Because merit is that which allows our hearts to recover and which raises the heart, which gives it energy. And it gives us happiness, the happiness that we gain from sacrificing, from giving. We get the merit from that. And then we also have um, the time now to be meditating, to be practicing. And we do this to bring our minds to peace. And this cultivating of inner peace, the training of the mind, it's the highest form of merit. Because we see that normally our minds rush after all of the sense impressions that they experience. When we have these inner sense bases, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, in the mind, then there will be the ex or there is also the external sense media, and that of sights or forms, and of sounds, of odors, tastes, tactile sensations, and then thoughts. And then when these two meet with each other, there's pasa, there's this contact. And so from that then comes Vedana. This flows on. There's this pleasant Vedana, pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, or neutral feelings. And so these arise. And then when they arise, just one kind of them comes up, then immediately and there is craving. And then from this, there's clinging and becoming and birth. And then dukkha, the suffering, arises. And this process, it happens very, very quickly. And it has avijja, ignorance, as its leader. And then there's sankharas, there's proliferation, vijnana, sense consciousness that comes up, uh, physicality, mentality. So the Buddha, he contemplated this in the third watch of the night as he was sitting underneath the Bodhi tree, contemplated into uh, Paticca Samuppada, this dependent co-arising, which is that, which is that, that all phenomena, these phenomena, they require a cause for them to arise. So just like when we have an eye, but say that we're blind, those eyes aren't working, even though there are forms, there are colors, there won't be contact that arises because our eyes aren't good. So that feeling of sight doesn't come up. Or if we do have eyes that are functioning well, but there's no form, say we're in a place which is pitch black, then there is also no contact that arises. And so there's no feeling of sight that comes up this jakru, vinyana, the sense consciousness over the, the eye or over sight, this doesn't arise. So in order for that jakru, vinyana to appear, um, there needs to be these conditions, it needs to rely upon a functioning eye, and also upon light and upon form as well. And there too needs to be an intention, this jetana, an intention of interest in that, and when all these things come together, then there's jaku vinyana, uh, the sense consciousness over sight that appears. But when we have that coming up, the mind attaches to it. I see, I hear, for example. So this I, it appears immediately. 
Or if that doesn't come up, if there isn't that feeling that arises, then it's me who doesn't see, I don't see. So just this I, this me appearing all over again. But the Buddha, he contemplated this, and he did so with a mind which had incredible peace to it. And he was able to separate his mind from ignorance, craving, and clinging. And he could see clearly into this process as it was happening, how these dhammas are conditioned. And they're not a self, they're not a being, they're not other. So you could see how this avijja then leads on to these, uh, this proliferation. And then physicality, mentality, and it goes all the way on to becoming and birth. And this is due to the ignorance there present within the heart. And this gives rise to attachment. So this feeling of sight, this feeling of hearing, of smelling, of tasting, of touching. Um, It becomes the cause then for craving and for clinging, and then for dukkha, the suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair. And so this is the process of the suffering, of how it happens. And Numpucha, he gave a comparison He gave a simile, which um, is really good. It's a very good teaching, something well worth listening to. He said, it's like we fall from a tree. And as we fall, we pass many, many branches, right from the top down to the bottom. But we fall so quickly that we don't know what's going on. All we know is that we've hit the ground and that it's painful. And there's this thump as we hit the ground. But we don't have enough time to count all the branches as we go down. Uh, um, Contemplation, it's not speedy enough for that. And so with this process of dependent origination, our contemplation, it doesn't happen in time. When the eye sees a form, then either we like that or we dislike it. And then that goes into becoming birth. And then we suffer immediately. So we need to have a lot of mindfulness. And the Buddha, his mindfulness was at a full and complete state already. So he could contemplate these dhammas and see them clearly. He could see how all skillful qualities and unskillful qualities are just dhammas, they're just phenomena. They're not a being, they're not a self, they're not a person, an individual. And so his mind separated out from all of these phenomena being they skillful or unskillful, and he could see that they were merely phenomena. There's no being, no me, no mind there. And so his mind became free from all suffering, and he attained to being the fully self-awakened Buddha. So he knew very well that it would be difficult for the beings of this world to practice following this path, And so he enjoyed the bliss of liberation for 49 days. And then he contemplated once again, he reflected and asked, well, who is it who could understand and receive these teachings? But his two former teachers, uh, Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta, um, they had passed away in a state of jhana, And so being in these states of absorption, um, they didn't have the sense basis to be able to receive anything. And so the first was in uh, Rupa Jhana, in this Jhana form. And so his mind was just focused uh, completely on form to the extent where he wasn't interested in anything else. There wasn't any thinking, there wasn't any proliferation. And he was under the impression that this was already a great form of happiness. And his other teacher was in a state of ahrupa jhana, um, focusing just on mental qualities. And again, not interested in receiving anything, because he was just focused on that. 
So he wasn't capable of receiving, of knowing anything externally. And so if the Buddha was able to teach them, then it would have just required a single teaching and they would have instantly attained to arahantship. There'd be no need to be born again, to die again. But being in the state of rupa jhana and arupa jhana, they did need to be born again and get born into the human world after they left that Brahma world. And really the benefits of jhana are a lot. Um, that when one leaves that state of jhana, one doesn't fall down into the woeful states, but rather one becomes a human. But for us, we wish to develop our minds to the highest level, to reach nibbana. And so what then should we do to get there? Well, right here in this present moment, we must let go and put down physical things, put down mental things. It's not to not attach to anything, not um, give the meaning to things that these are me or these are mine. Perceive this body as just being a body, not a being, a person, an individual, a self, an other. Because really all beings, all people are the same. We all have breath, we all inhale oxygen, we all need to take in water, and this is the same for all of us. Our fire element, the heat in the body, is all the same. And we all have things that are hard in this body. We have hair, hair of the head, hair of the body. We have nails, we have teeth and skin. And all of us have these elements. And these elements, they come from this world, and that's true for all people. And we're not any different in this regard. But it's when ignorance is clouding the mind that we take these things to be me and mine. And so we give rise to this differentiation, differentiation the separation, um, separating out uh, me and others. But we can ask ourselves, well, who is it that says that these things are um, different? And who is it that claims that this body is me or mine? If the breath isn't flowing in the body anymore, um, then we may ask it, but it doesn't give us any answer. It doesn't claim to be a being. It doesn't claim to be me. It doesn't claim to be a body of anyone else. And these things are just uh, conventions. But our minds, they become deluded in these conventions, and they attach to them. And when this is the case, then vimuti, liberation, can't arise. But if our minds are contemplating into this body, seeing it as being just a collection of four elements, and seeing it as being no different, that this body is just four elements, the body of other people is just a collection of four elements, the bodies of all animals are just a collection of four elements. And we'll see that we won't be able to find any being, any self, any other there. And we'll see clearly that all there is is arising, staying for a while, and ceasing. And these are all dhammas, all phenomena, which have causes that give their arising. And so all physical phenomena have causes for them to arise. All forms that we see have causes for them to arise. And when those causes run out, then those forms, those physical things, they uh, deteriorate, they disappear. But how is it that we attach to these things as being a self? Because really, there's no self there. But if we attach to them as being self, <coughs> And then this will give rise to feelings of hate, of anger, of love. And if those feelings of hate or of love are within the bounds of sila dhamma, of what's moral, what's virtuous, then there's one degree of peace that we experience. But if those feelings get too strong to the extent that we lose our virtue, 
then this creates agitation and chaos. So the Buddha said that we should keep these precepts well. Because being in a state where we have greed, hatred, and delusion, we're still attached to me and mine and other, then we need to have this quality of virtue, of sila. And we also need to have kanti, this patient endurance, forbearance, with all of these emotions and sense experiences um, that we come into contact to. The feelings that the kilesas give rise to, those feelings of greed, of hatred and delusion that come up within the heart, we need to control those and not let them spill out through our actions of body and speech. And when we can keep our body and speech composed well, then that means that we have sila. So at the very least, we need to have the sila, we need to have the qualities of a human. But there may also be a lot of confusion within the mind. There may be doubts or um, being confused about any sense experiences that we come into contact through um, external means. So we need then to come to train our minds, to have mindfulness, to be looking over these minds, seeing it where it is that our thoughts are going off to. If they're going off in an unskillful direction, then we try to put that down, to abandon that. If it's skillful, then we try to cultivate that, nourish it, develop it, always looking after these hearts of ours. In order to do that, we need a meditation object that's supervising our minds such as the word buddha or dhamma or sangha, where no matter where we're going, what posture we're in, um, then we need to be always looking over these minds and always taking these meditation words with us. When the mind is in a state of peace, then we can come to contemplate this body, seeing it as just being a heap of earth, water, fire and air. And there's no permanent thing there within it. There's no self, no being to be found. So this is what the Buddha taught to Venerable Anya Kondanya, that all things that are of the nature to arise are of the nature to cease. So when there are causes for forms to arise, then they will arise. And that's just the nature for that to happen. And when those causes run out, then those forms will disappear naturally. It's the same for all mental events as well, that all of them which are of the nature to arise do so through causes, and when those causes leave, then they disappear naturally. So our mind shouldn't attach or give meaning to these things as being a being or a self, or another. Venerable Anya Kondanya understood this, and through that understanding he gained the eye of Dhamma. And then next the Buddha taught Venerable uh, Wapa, Badiya, Mahanama, and Asaji, and they all saw and understood the Dhamma in stages. And then he taught the Anatalakana Sutta, about the characteristics of uh, impermanent stress and not-self, and how all physical and mental things are um, like this. They have these characteristics there within them. And through that, all five of them attain to arahantship, and not just that, but the highest level of arahants. So we see that it is possible to cultivate, develop these minds to that level to becoming arahants. But if we don't do that, if the mind is caught up with ignorance, then it's possible for them to fall very far as well, maybe even fall into the lowest hell realm. So what then can we do to block off hell or to stop the mind from falling into any of these woeful states? But we need to follow the teachings of the Buddha, to build up goodness, to make our hearts better, to raise them up. 
And so we're generous, we keep the precepts, we listen to the Dhamma, and we practice, we train these minds so that they're well established in samadhi. Always looking after the mind, teaching it to be better, to be higher. And at the very least, the mind will raise up to heaven, and become a deva. And so a deva is one who is in an exalted state, and they have these qualities of wise, um, skillful, shame and fear of wrongdoing. So we should try to build up within our own minds, build up goodness there. So we have these qualities of generosity, of virtue and of meditation. Throughout our normal lives, then we try to keep the mind on the level of a human. And when you come to the monastery and we chant, we meditate, we listen to the Dhamma, and then the heart um, lifts up through that, becomes joyful, it raises up to the level of a deva. And this is really good if we can do that. And then we use this mind to contemplate in order to find the truth, in order to see the truth. Just like how the Buddha <coughs> taught that the body is just a body. And so we can ask ourselves, well, is that real? Is that teaching actually true? And so like we're all sitting here with our bodies, and all our bodies, everyone here, they have breath flowing through them. We all need water, we all need to eat as well. And if we don't have one of these things, if we don't breathe, for example, then that means that we're dead. All of these elements fall apart and they return back to the world. So then why is it that we become deluded in these things? Why do we think that they really are me? And when we think this, then greed, hatred, delusion arises. And it can be to the point where we lose all sense of virtue, of goodness. And the mind becomes black and dark through this ignorance. So we should try to build up a lot of goodness before our bodies get old. Because when they're old, then it's difficult to do a lot with them. And when we're moving, whenever we're exercising, moving about, then we contemplate as well. We have mindfulness with what we're doing. And through that, then we gain energy of body. And we also have mindfulness, so we gain energy of mind as well. <laughs> and this mindfulness, this energy of mind, it gives us a strong immune system from, in order to ward off the defilements. And then we can contemplate and let go of all sense impressions. And no matter how important anything may be, letting go is always more important. We shouldn't attach to them as being me or mine. And then through this the heart becomes at ease because it's seen the Dhamma, because it's seen the truth. So whenever we have any of these sense bases, there's an eye, or eyes, there's ears, there's nose, there's tongue, there's body, um, we should see that there's no self to any of these things. When the eye meets with a form, and then jaku vinyana, the sense consciousness of sight, appears, um, we see how that isn't a self, there's no self there. Or like listening to this Dharma talk right now, but when I stop speaking, then there won't be um, any perception of that sound anymore. So there's just a rising and ceasing, a rising and ceasing that's happening all the time. So we need then to investigate this arising, staying, ceasing, arising, staying, ceasing. Understanding how we can't find any being, any self, any other there within it. All of the subjects that we study at school, we do this to gain a kind of worldly knowledge in order to live our lives comfortably, in order to um, have a good occupation. And so there are many different subjects that we can study, that of law or of medicine or of engineering. And we use this in a way that gives us benefit uh, to live our lives in this world. But the Dhamma is something that 
all hearts, all minds need to study. Uh, Because a mind which is devoid of Dhamma is incapable of winning out over greed, hatred and delusion. Even though we may study many different subjects in the world, none of those um, can give us the ability to defeat the kilesas. And um, they can give us the ability to live our lives in this world without difficulty. But we need to develop our hearts. We need to have Dhamma in order to be able to defeat the defilements. And so we raise up goodness. We build up all of these skillful, beautiful qualities in our hearts. And so we don't, we have a sense of sacrifice and of giving. We aren't self-centered, but rather we think about the communities that we live in and work for their benefit. We have kindness towards all beings. And so being born into this world, that if we live our lives in a good way, then they have meaning to them. And the meaning is that of developing our hearts to be higher and higher, to the highest level of seeing the noble truths, the truths of, of suffering or stress, this dukkha, um, the cause of dukkha, its cessation, and the path leading to that cessation. But if we live our lives in a deluded way, if we're always foolish through ignorance, <coughs> And then being born into this world, it doesn't really give much meaning. Really, we get born and then our defilements just increase and increase. There's more heat, there's more agitation. And that's because we don't follow this way of Dhamma. So then dying from this world, we're likely to be born in a painful, woeful state. And because we haven't sought out goodness in this life. So therefore all of us need to be very firm in our virtue, in our precepts, and to be seeking out this practice, intent on this practice, and studying so that our hearts raise to a higher and higher level until we meet with true goodness, until we see how all physical and mental things are of the nature to change and stressful and not self. And through that, then, we gain the eye of Dhamma. And we're able to close off these woeful states of existence. We're able to cut off these fetters of self-view, uh, attachments to rites and rituals and skeptical doubt. And our minds are firm, firm in the Dhamma. They're unshakable in that regard. And even though there's still greed, hatred, and delusion present within the mind, we have mindfulness there, which is able to restrain our minds, able to hold them back, able to be cultivating our hearts until they reach Nibbāna. And so this Dhamma teaching uh, that I'm giving now, it's probably appropriate for it uh, to end now. And so may all of you contemplate this teaching and walk along this path of practice, this path of developing your hearts, cultivating your minds to be higher and higher, going from a human state to the mind of a deva. And our goal is to reach Nibbāna, and perhaps we can get there in this life. And if we gain the eye of Dhamma in this life, um, there will be no more than seven lives. And then we will reach the end of all suffering. So being born into this life, uh, we study and then we work in order to find wealth. And those people with a lot of wisdom will be able to gain a lot. Those with little wisdom will gain a little. But no matter how much or how little we gain, we have to leave all of that behind. We have to toss all of that away in this world. 
If we gain a lot, then we leave a lot behind. If we gain a little, we leave a little behind when we die. We're not able to take any of it with us. And so if we seek out wealth so much that we don't have any time to practice, then this doesn't give us any benefit. And so we should come back to ourselves and contemplating in order to find the wealth that we can take with us past this world. And this is the most important kind of wealth. And so may all of you be sincere in this practice. May all of you develop and grow in the Dhamma.